good morning, everybody, to this uh, happy webinar held today because we published a report this morning called uh, Understanding China, uh, the study of uh, China and Mandarin in uh, schools and universities in the UK. There it is. You're very welcome to have a hard copy uh, if you would like, and it's also available uh, on our website. Um, thank you all for uh, signing up to attend. Um, we, the format for this morning, we like to keep our, our webinars quite pacey and quite uh, short, so we've only got an hour and a quarter. We're going to try and cram a lot into that. So the format for this morning is we're going to start by hearing from Michael Matzler, who's a former colleague of ours at uh, here at HEPI, the Higher Education Policy Institute, where I'm the, uh, I'm the director, Nick Hillman. Um, and uh, Michael now works for the NAUS Consulting Group, but when he uh, worked at HEPI, he led on all our work on China, including editing another another report, UK Universities and China, that we produced about 18 months ago and ran our daily blog, for which uh, you must all sign up if you're not already uh, already sign up, signed up. And then after Michael, who will outline his conclusions from his report, uh, we're going to move to a panel session. I'll introduce our four uh, fantastic stellar panellists uh, just before the panel session. Uh, and then after the panel session, I hope there'll be half an hour or so left uh, for a Q Q and a So do please uh, put the questions in the Q&A box at the bottom uh, of your screen. If you've got any techie problems, put those in the chat. Uh, uh, it's all uh, on the record. There are some journalists listening in and we're also recording the session. So um, please be aware of, of that. Uh, and then one final little bit of housekeeping. If um, you would like to ask a question, um, ideally, we quite like it if people ask their own questions. So we'll get you, we'll, we'll turn on your microphone when it's your turn uh, and get you to put your own question. We won't turn on your camera, just your microphone. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. We can read your questions out. But we want to make this as participatory as, uh, pos as possible. And the final thing I'd like to say uh, before I turn to Michael is just to welcome, I know we've got a lot of people listening from schools, normally happy events. Uh, have a, 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 a mainly an audience from universities, and we've got a big audience from universities today as well. We've also got a lot of people from school, so a particular welcome uh, to, to all of you, both students and uh, teachers. Um, and with no further ado, I'm going to turn over to uh, Michael, the author of the report we've launched this morning. Michael. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, really pleased to be here today um, and great to be having this discussion. Um, the paper is a contribution to an issue, I think, which hasn't had the attention it deserves. Um, it doesn't seek to be the final word. Um, Michael, we missed your first few uh, seconds there. Oh, sure, I can. I'll, I'll recap. Just to say, really pleased to be here um, and that it's great to be having um, the discussion. Uh, I don't think the paper is the final word, but rather a contribution to a topic which which hasn't had the attention it deserves. Um, just a quick a quick thanks to Emma and Lucy at Happy Auto who've been key in putting this event and paper together in the last few weeks, um, and to the University of St Andrews for um, generously sponsoring the paper. Um, I'm going to jump straight in and stick to my ten minutes because I'm really excited to hear from from the panel. Um, Today's paper focuses on the study of China and Mandarin in schools and universities, and it comes in the context of ongoing debates about the UK's relationship with China. <clears throat> in the last few years, the UK's relationship with China has been changing, moving away from a golden age of relations towards something different and less warm. Um, and on the back of this, there have been many research and policy reports exploring this area, often with an eye to understand how the UK should position itself. Um, these have offered a wide range of views, um, with some calling for a closer relationship with China, while others have argued that the UK should distance itself or even decouple. Um, ultimately, agreement on how to proceed has been hard to come by. Um, but there has been one point of consensus um, across every report I've read, um, which is that the UK lacks what has been called China competency, China literacy and China capabilities. <clears throat> but in essence, they all refer to the fact that the UK lacks sufficient knowledge and understanding of China across public and private sectors to build the answers to issues which which hinge on which hinge on China um, and this isn't this isn't just common to papers from from the diverse groups such as KCL policy unit RUSI, the China research group British foreign policy group HEPI and even the House of Lords international relations and defense committee but in each case 
growing China literacy capability and capabilities um, is identified as a key issue um, and is highlighted either as a point that underpins all of the other recommendations in each of the reports or in the cases of reports that define what a national strategy on China should look like, growing literacy, grow, pardon me, growing China literacy is presented as a prerequisite for any effective engagement. So the, the idea that we need to grow China literacy is a first step and a vital one in this context. Um, approximately a year ago, um, the government published um, their integrated review of security, defense, development, and foreign policy, um, which noted, uh, and I'll quote, um, the need to enhance China facing capabilities to develop a better understanding of China and its people while improving our ability to respond to the systemic challenge that it poses to our security, prosperity and values. However, neither the review nor any report since have clarified what building China capabilities and literacy might entail. Um, and that's really the aim of the report today. Um, today's report argues that the government needs to build a strategy to grow its China capabilities. Um, and ensure that it's a resource um, which the UK will have in the future. Um, the emphasis on the report is on schools and universities, supporting this both in the short and longer term. Um, I just want to turn quickly to talking about what China literacy refers to. Um, building on the reports and the 40, well, more than 40 interviews um, I conducted with individuals across finance, business, civil society, higher education and beyond, um, it was highlighted that there were two key components in any given context. And they were a mix of language expertise, normally Mandarin, um, and a solid knowledge of China. And often these came hand in hand, but not always. Um, in different contexts, you know, there'll be different needs for more language ability or more simply understanding of the culture. But these were the two key elements which were common across um, all the examples. Um, so with that, with that in mind, um, and, and just before I turn to outlining the, the, role of, the role of schools and universities, I want to highlight two examples that give a sense of the scope of the issue of the lack of, of China competency in the UK. Um, firstly, um, a quote from Professor Kerry Brown in his, um, in his book on UK-China relations, um, which I think highlights um, how, that, you know, the state of uh, undergraduate study in UK universities. So he said, in 1999, there were 300 graduates in Chinese language from British universities. In 2015, long after China had overtaken the UK to become the world's second largest economy, the largest exporter, second largest importer, the chief trading partner to over 120 countries and the holder of the world's largest foreign currency reserves and producer of the world's largest cohort of international students and tourists, that figure had remained at just 300 graduates. The British Association of Chinese Studies reports that since 2015, the picture is largely the same. While there has been an increase in interest from undergraduates on courses which would involve China in some way, like history, economics, politics, um, and that there are undergraduates who take one or two modules in China, um, the number of undergraduates at British universities gaining a level of expertise in China remains really low. And that this, is, this, this illustrates the problem, I think, quite well. Um, and the second point I want to highlight is around the impact of the lack of Mandarin speakers. So in reference to language in particular, um, Cardiff Business School and more recently the University of Cambridge with RAND Europe um, highlighted the cost um, which language, uh, which the lack of language speakers the UK has more generally is costing the UK and missed opportunities. The case for Mandarin is that this is likely in the hundreds of millions of pounds each year. Um, this isn't really surprising. The British Council and British Academy have published reports time and again over the, over the last 10 years and more um, about the importance of languages in the UK and each time Mandarin has been identified as a critical language, um, but we're still faced with this problem. So where do we go from here? Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna turn to some of the recommendations from the report. Um, so first of all, um, there needs to be a coordinated national response. Um, this would be best achieved by a government led strategy um, it wouldn't have to be grandiose and would probably fit well within a broader UK China strategic plan, which has been called for for both a long time and for many quarters. Um, responsibilities for the chi building China competency could be invested in a small team across the Department for Trade, the FCDO and the Department for Education. Um, thinking about the, the, the need for competency, it's both a long and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an immediate, a long term problem, but also an immediate term need. Um, 
so a small pot of money would go a long way to ensure um, that in the longer term um, there will be both a pool of Mandarin speakers and individuals with a solid understanding of China and a secure pipeline that ensures its sustainability. Um, I'm aware of time, so I'm just going to move uh, quickly on to um, some of the main recommendations of the report. Um, and there are three themes I just quickly want to cover. Um, the first is the largest barrier to increasing the pool of Chinese studies graduates. Um, and the biggest, the biggest issue here, which came from the report, is that there's just not enough demand from school leavers. Um, this is mostly down to a historic lack of exposure to China and UK schools. While there has been some positive change in recent years, with a Department for Education funded programme supporting Mandarin teaching in schools to GCSE, um, this is really the limit of, of any progress. And there are lots of opportunities which are achievable, affordable, and could be really effective to drive this forward. Um, these range from um, China roadshows, um, which expose people to China for a day. For example, H.J. Colston, who founded the Chopsticks Club, runs day-long sessions for whole year groups to expose people to China. Uh, and there's a very sweet video of a child at the end of a session saying that they had, off the back of the, one of the sessions, been inspired to ch study Chinese at university. But the most compelling of all the um, ways in schools, I think, is to explore the idea of, of an A-level Chinese civilization. Um, a useful parallel might be A-level classical civilization, which opened up classics university to thousands of people who did not have the option to study Latin and, and Greek at school, or who didn't have um, the language skills or experience learning languages, which they might need to tackle uh, a famously difficult language, um, in this case, which would be Chinese um, Mandarin. Um, the second issue I just want to touch upon is issues in schools around um, how languages are constructed more generally. So GCSE and A-level curricula are not suited to non-European languages, and of course that includes Mandarin. Um, I think you know some of the key issues in here is, is the lack of, a, uh, of an alphabet um, and uh, the tonal system in Mandarin, which just doesn't map usefully onto um, the, the structures for which have been designed to support languages like French and German and Italian. And so the Department for Education needs to, needs to inter intervene and, and review how those are examined. Um, and just, and just um, I'm aware we're sh I'm slightly short on time, so I, I won't touch too much on universities. Um, but I just say that um, we know Chinese studies is intensive to teach and is suffering low numbers. Um, and in recent years, a number of undergraduate courses have closed. And in the longer term, in the, in the recent past, um, a number of departments have closed too. And where, where teaching positions are lost, we know research disappears too. Um, one head of a China Institute said in an interview with me that they could not run an undergraduate course because there was not enough, not enough demand. Um, so to support China centres to stay open and support quality courses, the Office of Students should review whether Chinese studies should be eligible for targeted funding as a vulnerable and priority area. Um, there's so much more to say in the, um, and so much more to say and so much more in the paper, which I'd really urge you to read. read. But I'm really looking forward to hearing um, from the panel and the QA. Uh, thanks, Nick. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Michael, uh, very much. Uh, um, Emma, I think you need to start my video. I won't let me do it. Great. Um, so thank you, Michael, very much for that. And do read uh, Michael's report. I'm going to move straight on to the panel. I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. And we'll include Michael in the Q&A so you can put direct questions to him as well. And our first panellist I'm going to go to is Lord Johnson of Marlebone. Uh, Joe Johnson, as many of us know, uh, Universities and Science Minister twice. Uh, uh, so, um, but I think, and we partly asked you, Joe, of course, to come on this panel for that reason, but also because you're the co-author of what is really a superb report from the King's Policy Institute on uh, the China question, uh, which is a sort of model really of how these papers should be written. Um, and so, Joe, it's a huge pleasure to have you here, and um, over to you. Great. Thank you, Nick. And, um, you know, great to be here, and thanks for those nice words about the paper we did. Um, uh, just three, three quick points. I mean, first of all, congratulations to Michael and to Happy for continuing to lead this debate on China um, and the UK education system. I think the Happy report that's come out today, you know, usefully highlights the very broad price we're going to pay as a society for neglecting languages generally. Um, if global Britain is to mean anything, um, it's extraordinary that, um, you, know, you know, it should be about international openness and new trade partnerships. And 
in that context, you know, it is extraordinary that we're allowing the teaching of languages to decline, you know, towards towards extinction in this way. And um, I thought the recommendations that uh, the HEPI report, Michael's report made were sensible and deliverable. You know, he highlighted usefully to me the fact that the pre-U qualification in Mandarin Chinese is going to close uh, next year, leaving only an A-level language route that for various reasons doesn't appeal to non-native speakers of the language. And it's clear to me that the Department for Education should step in and ensure the availability of study routes in Chinese other than this uh, pretty problematic language A-level, which, which is too tough for non-native speakers. Um, and you know, the idea of having a some kind of level three qualification, such as an A-level in Chinese civilization, you know, would appear to make sense to me. I would also suggest that the, in addition to, to Michael's recommendations, that the government and the department might want to get behind uh, John Clawton's excellent uh, world of languages, languages of the world uh, framework for the teaching of languages, which really aims to transform um, the approach to, to language in our, in our primary and secondary schools. It's a great campaign and um, I think the department would do well to pick it up. Um, second point is, you know, I think the lack of China literacy um, poses specific risks to UK higher education and research. Um, and these were points which we made in the report you mentioned, Nick. On the student side of things in higher education, I'm one of the biggest fans of international student mobility, um, I hope. Um, you know, I do work tirelessly to promote international student mobility, but we've got to recognize that the large numbers from China have the potential um, to become something of a double-edged sword for the sector if the geopolitics um, harden uh, unexpectedly and undesirably. O on the one hand, you know, we're clearly very lucky to have a large number of brilliant Chinese students in this country from whom domestic students can learn about China secondhand. So if we're not, if we're not able to uh, go to China in large numbers and if we don't have that linguistic ability, which the report from HEPI today highlights, then at least we have through Chinese students in the UK an opportunity to learn directly about the country and the culture and the people and that's and that's wonderful it's a priceless living bridge between our two countries and we're very very lucky um, to have it on the other hand and this is the other side of uh, the, the issue and we've got to recognize that we have a significant number of uh, prestigious institutions in the elite russell group that would be hold below the waterline financially um, in the event of a sharp downturn in student numbers from China, yet are doing, as far as I can see, next to nothing to ensure themselves against you know, the risk of a sudden hardening of the geopolitics. I don't see how this situation can realistically continue. The Office for Students has a legal duty to monitor and report on the financial sustainability of the sector but I'm not aware of it uh, instructing higher education institutions to uh, look at this risk very carefully and to diversify their international student bodies uh, where appropriate. I'd be interested to understand what it, what it intends to do in this respect. It seems to me to be an essential intervention for it to make, given the risks to the sustainability, the financial sustainability of our higher education system and wider UK knowledge economy. Final point um, on the research side. Again, you know the, the fact that there are that there is such a rich uh, network of research collaborations between the UK and China is brilliant. Um, you know we are able to piggyback on the world's largest spender on R and D today, and that's China through these research collaborations, and it gives our uh, researchers an opportunity to 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 to, to work on to work on projects um, with with a country that's going to be one of the powerhouses of global science in the de in decades to come. China has been investing very heavily in international collaboration with key countries like the UK and has pumped considerable funding into the UK research base. Uh, it's poised to become the UK's most important research partner. 
and a very high proportion of the UK's most impactful research in key fields like automation and material science is now done in collaboration with China. So English speaking Chinese scholars from China working in the UK or with UK partners are able to gain excellent insight through all these collaborations into the UK research base, how it works, how priorities are chosen, and what is currently being done in the UK. I think it is very important to ask, though, whether non-Chinese speaking UK researchers are getting an equally complete and candid view of their partners' facilities, activities, and discoveries. And indeed, are they conscious that they should have such a view? So a key research policy question that links to this whole issue of language is, is whether collaboration has proceeded and with a full and mutual awareness, a properly constituted contractual base for knowledge management, whether there are agreements for full and mutual disclosure and reciprocal participation and knowledge exchange on both sides. Last half point, we assume that past patterns of internationalization will continue with the Chinese government requiring scholars to publish in ranked English language journals. Now this obviously suits monolingual British researchers, but there is a possibility that we will see China broadening measures to decouple intellectually from the West. Now, my understanding is that such steps to decouple intellectually from the West have hitherto been limited to um, avoiding sort of areas that, that would threaten the, the CPC's narrative, certain sort of Western liberal ideas, but a broader decoupling would potentially cut off visibility into you know, what is now going to be the world's largest spender on, on R&D. We can always, of course, rely on Google Translate to, 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 to see what China's researchers are producing if they do end up publishing more in Chinese languages that we can't understand. But my guess is that if we really want to keep on top of what's going on in the labs and in the research base of the world's biggest spender on R&D, languages really are going to matter to our ability to stay at the cutting edge of science in years to come. Uh, thanks so much, Joe, and I do urge people to look at uh, Joe's uh, co-authored paper for the King's Policy uh, Institute because it does uh, flesh out a lot of those um, points that Joe's just put on the table in a really effective way. So thanks, Joe, for broadening the discussion uh, like that very helpfully. I'm now going to turn to Professor Rana Mitter. Um, I've not met Rana before, but I feel like I know you, Rana, because I've learned so much from you uh, on the airwaves uh, as being a, a sage voice. Uh, uh, on, on in much of the media on these issues, and I, you, your own uh, academic output, of course, uh, has included many books on modern China. Um, and thank you for contributing a foreword to our report today that I think contextualizes Michael's findings very nicely. So uh, over to you, Rana. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Nick. And of course, I'm very aware of the great work that you and Happy have been doing. And a pleasure to hear from Michael, who's done so much on this, and from Joe Johnson, who, of course, is uh, one of the great parliamentary experts on the uh, on the sector. Uh, I'm speaking this morning from Oxford, where I see outside my window it's just started snowing. So I don't know whether that's um, an omen of climate change and the need for global uh, cooperation in terms of dealing with it, perhaps some sort of symbol for what we're doing this uh, th th this morning. And I just wanted to make a couple of comments off the back of the, I think, very sensible, very cogent comments that have been made already by, by previous this uh, speakers to try and avoid going over the same ground um, again. I thought it was very kind in your brief introduction, um, Nick, that you mentioned um, uh, media and my occasional comments on, on China um, in it, because actually one of the sort of test questions I use as a sort of starting point when I'm talking to uh, groups in the public sphere or the private sphere in the UK, business, media, politicians, academia, whoever it might be, um, in terms of getting a handle on what this China literacy thing might actually mean. Um, I often ask the following question. I say, you know, does everyone here have Netflix? And everyone sticks up their hand. And I say, what did you last watch? And they say they watched whatever, you know, The Chair or Squid Game or something. And then I say, um, how many of you, what was the last Chinese television program you watched? And not with everyone, but for the majority of people, it actually comes as news that if you go on YouTube and 
click in the name of you know any of the recent big hit TV series that have had hundreds of millions of viewers in China. They're all available for free, uploaded there, you know, 49 episodes, whatever it might be, with English subtitles. You don't need to know a word of Chinese to uh, to, to watch them. Um, nothing but 30, um, uh, Autumn Cicada, um, In the Name of the People, just to name a few which have, have uh, I've, I've found fascinating. My point, of course, is not that everyone should spend their entire time on YouTube, uh, not least because I don't want to give Joe Johnson a misleading idea of what Oxford academics do with their, uh, their time. We're working very hard, I assure you. But rather, the wider point that knowing about what people go home in the evening at seven o'clock in the evening and watch on television is actually just one of the indicators of having that comfort level, that literacy in a wider sense of the phrase about a particular society. You know, in, in our own side of the UK, knowing what Dad's army is for one generation um, would be a very important uh, uh, indicator of that. So I'll shut up about television now because uh, you know that's not the the, the point that I've, I've, I'm trying to make in the wider wider sense. But to get to that sort of wider issue of what it is that we're actually see, seeking to achieve. And one thing I'd say also, having seen the very distinguished list of people who signed up for this particular event um, this morning, is that I can see that other people I know, and I know quite a few. There are people with very different views on China from within the UK sphere, sphere. There are people who have made it their life's work to try and make sure that on the big issues, on climate change, on uh, trade agreements, on education and languages, that we speak closely and in a familiar and um, friendly manner to China in a way that we have to do with the world's uh, rising uh, major power. There are also people I see who have spoken truthfully and bravely about many of the very problematic aspects of what's happening in China, including inevitably on human rights, and in some cases have suffered quite badly for it. I hope that all of those groups and those who sit somewhere in between would agree on one thing, which is that knowing how we can talk to China and being able to talk to China in terms which China will understand is a really important part of that educational process. And for me, as I say in the report uh, forward that uh, the um, uh, uh, Hebi were kind enough to ask me to write, um, there, are, there are three things I just want to, 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 to flag up. Number one is to pick up exactly on Joe Johnson's last point. Having people born and brought up in the UK from whatever um, heritage background, uh, you know, it may well be from the British Chinese community, and I think we need more of that voice actually in our public sphere. It's an underrepresented voice in, in all sorts of ways. But, um, you know, people like myself who come from a British South Asian background getting into China strikes me as no bad thing, or um, whatever um, socioeconomic gender um, or um, uh, heritage background we're talking about, they can all and all should be encouraged more to engage with China in terms not necessarily of language learning, of course, that's one of the things, but having that sense of understanding a bit about the history, the culture, uh, what people watch on television at night, all these sorts of things as a way of then providing context and background for a wider formed view, because we are gonna have to have wider and more formed views about China in the UK for years and decades to come. We are not all going to have the same view. Some people will want to take a view that engagement with China should be minimal, because of issues to do with ethics, values, human rights. Others will argue on the grounds of business or on the grounds of international cooperation on issues such as climate change. We're going to have to get closer um, regardless of, uh, of, of those other values issues. These are valid debates to have and must be had, but they cannot be had unless the wider public sphere actually knows something more about China. And at the moment, it is possibly the major subject in our public life about which people I think in the general conversation have the relatively um, lowest level of, of knowledge. So that question of China literacy without uh, necessarily speaking about language is I think a wider project that we should be pushing to engage with, perhaps thinking about it as a sort of you know, Chinese culture uh, boot camp or whatever it might, 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 might be. The second point though does relate to language. And I think the figures that we've had put in by Kerry Brown and, and others about quite how few um, people are actually learning uh, Mandarin language or Mandarin spoken language and Chinese language more broadly. Cantonese also be a great thing to have more people learning for a whole variety of, um, uh, of, of, of reasons, I would, uh, I would say. But it's just a tiny number of um, learners at the moment. It has to be increased. And I would say that if 
as the direction of travel seems to be in terms of government and public pressure, that that funding should be very separated from any political influence. And yeah, that's a perfectly reasonable and sensible thing to, to ask for. Then it does mean the funding has to come from somewhere. And this is where I stare into the screen at people who may be connected with government or with business or parts of the wider public sphere that want Britain to have its own independent Mandarin and Chinese language learning capacity, but then have to answer the next question, next question, where does it get funded from? Along the course of that wider China expertise that I've mentioned, China has some of the you know, most important China research centers and universities in particular in the, uh, in the, in the whole of Europe, uh, let alone the Western world. Most of them, and uh, you may feel a certain amount of personal feeling here, are not really funded uh, in any kind of continuing sense. Uh, people do their work, they do it, I think, very well. But the idea that this is an unreliable source of knowledge uh, which can be grown is uh, sorry, unreliable in the sense of not being stable in its funding, I think is something that has to be addressed much more uh, explicitly. Uh, it hasn't yet, I think, been strategized in any sense that, that most of us involved in the sector can see. The final note that I'll put forward, because I know there are other speakers and a lot of questions to, 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 to get in, is this. I think that we should be, again, taking up something that I think Joe, Joe Johnson said, be pushing very politely, but much harder to make it clear that we, meaning the UK education sector, want to be back in China. Um, on a very parochial but important level, those language uh, learners that I'm talking about cannot get the level of fluency and, and uh, immersion in Chinese that they need unless they're allowed back into China for language classes. And as you'll know, because COVID has still kept China uh, shut down for, uh, for quite some considerable time now, it's been very difficult, quite impossible really, um, except in some very limited cases, to get students into the language training uh, immersion programs that they should be part of. There have been suspicions, I hope they're wrong, that there's a sort of political incentive on the Chinese side in not having too many foreign students come back into the country. I would like to think that this should be a mutual and reciprocal set of engagements. We are beginning, and I this morning have just been involved in writing an invitation letter for a Chinese scholar from Beijing to come and visit Oxford. Very glad to do that and hope I will be doing it often. I would like to be back in the world where we have more of our students getting out to Beijing, to Shanghai, being in those programs and making sure that they are studying Mandarin and making sure that the numbers increase radically from where they are at the moment. But for that, we need not only a push on the British side, and we should all be doing that, we also have to have a much more sensible, friendly, but robust conversation on the Chinese side, pointing out that these things do go both ways and that there's mutual benefit when we push in both uh, directions. So I hope that that list of slightly homely uh, prescriptions, uh, along with uh, an encouragement to go on YouTube and watch Nothing But 30, which is, is excellent, I have to say, uh, may set at least some of the agenda for the next phase of uh, our UK uh, broader education rather than higher education, perhaps, on uh, questions to do with China. Thank you, Nick, and back to you. Thank you, Rana. Thank you for those powerful uh, comments. Uh, just before I turn to Steph, uh, say that we've got a lot of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Do feel free to upvote, as I think the word, upvote the questions you most want to see answered, just in case we can't get through them all, and then we'll make sure the most popular ones do get put to the panel. Um, uh, and also there is a hashtag, Understanding China, if people are tweeting on social media about this. So <clears throat> let me now turn to Steph, Steph Harris, uh, who's currently the Acting Assistant Director for Policy and International Engagement at Universities UK International Unit. Steph uh, and Heppy, her team and Heppy produced a very detailed report last autumn on the uh, economic benefits to the UK of international students, including particularly, of course, Chinese students, uh, uh, broken down at a parliamentary constituency level, which is one of the, uh, a piece of work we're very uh, proud of. Um, and Steph, it's fantastic to have you here because I, I, I'm sorry to say, I think this is one of your final speeches in your current role because I think you're moving on quite soon. Um, it is indeed, Nick, and I'll therefore try my best to make it a good one. So um, thank you uh, to you and to Happy for inviting me along um, to join such an esteemed panel, and also, of course, to Michael for writing such an interesting and, and important uh, paper. Um, I think the first thing for me to say is that I wholeheartedly agree with one of the sentiments that's expressed in, in the paper, that, that an expert and working knowledge of, of China is crucial. Um, regardless of the UK's government uh, policy position with, with regards to, to China. 
um, in my eyes, uh, expert and also working uh, knowledge of, of a country is, is central to effective, um, to, to ensuring effective approach to both managing risks in international partnerships, but, but also ensuring their su success and, and making sure that, that they're achieving everything you set out to, to achieve. And, and to do that and to do that well, you, you clearly require a deep understanding of the international partners with which you're working. Um, I also agree with um, Rana's introductory comments in the reports and, and one that he's um, just re-articulated now that um, it does really important work of, of showing that there is the need for kind of two types perhaps of, of China expertise in, in the UK. The first of which is that specialist knowledge um, with kind of in-depth uh, linguistic um, specialisation on, on China and, and the second uh, more akin to that kind of expert working knowledge without necessarily um, any kind of uh, sophisticated um, uh, linguistic um, understanding. And, and I certainly run or go off and uh, uh, be perusing YouTube uh, this evening after, after work and, and, and taking up your good advice there on, on that second point. Um, I will, if, if you allow me to spend a, a couple of minutes on um, language in particular, and I guess on that, that first type of, of, of understanding and, and language specialism on, on China, um, as it is a key part of, of, of Michael's report. Um, UK um, was involved um, with one of the pieces of research that's highlighted in, in Michael's report um, led by the British Academy, which um, was towards a, a national language um, strategy. Um, and this work, I think, in, in this context is still um, crucial and, and highly relevant um, when we're thinking about how to improve um, the level of Mandarin um, uh, in, in the UK. And that report, and, and I won't go through all of the recommendations, but um, when it was focusing the bits that focus on higher education, um, its recommendations can broadly be split into to two, one of which was thinking about how to create demand among students um, through promotion, and then secondly, being able to meet um, that demand through su sufficient supply. So on demand, um, the uh, report and, and the National Languages and Strategy Project set out to ask the question of how we could create demand um, for languages and incentivize students to either continue studying a language or take up a, a new language. Clearly in the context of, of Mandarin, um, uh, initiatives such as the Mandarin Excellence Programme that I think has already been mentioned today, funded by the DfE and, and delivered by UCL's IOE, um, in partnership with the British Council is, is clearly essential to doing just that. Um, we also know that there is recognition um, by students at a higher education level of the value of languages as we're seeing a welcome increase in the number of students studying languages alongside and in addition to their degree um, awarding programmes through institution-wide language programmes that, that are clearly important in terms of higher education um, delivery. The strategy, the, the national towards the national language strategy, um, then went on to propose that we needed to build on all of that good work, um, however, and, and think about how the education and skills community could work together um, to establish and promote, promote um, Languages UK, which could be the kind of go-to place and um, a sort of umbrella portal which would share information about and, and promote the value of languages, building on the great precedent that's already been um, established with um, SHAPE, the, the new campaign in the UK to support arts, humanities and, and social science subjects. On supply, um, the, the British Academy work um, highlights that for universities to continue um, to offer high quality provision um, in an area of st strategic importance to the UK and to support the languages pipeline, um, the funding model um, needs to, to facilitate that. Um, and, and this is really vital to, to ensuring that um, a good range of languages, um, but also the provision of languages that are less widely studied, but still strategically valuable to the UK, such as uh, Mandarin Chinese um, can, can, can continue um, uh, at, at university level. Um, to support that and to support um, good funding, uh, we suggested that um, the UK government and funding bodies um, ensured that funding models for undergraduate education could cover the full cost of, of provision for language degrees, um, similar to some of the recommendations in, in Michael's report about full cost of, of provision. Um, and alongside this, additionally, the report recommended that UK governments and funding bodies could um, perhaps also create language challenge funds that would provide central funding pots um, in each of the jurisdictions of, of the UK and to which universities could bid should they wish to um, expand and, and create new provision. Moving away from uh, that paper, the, the, the paper um, with the British Academy, uh, Michael's 
paper also points out um, that the current um, government's global Britain agenda, which has also been mentioned a, a few times already today, cannot and should not ignore China. Um, at UK, and I think um, Joe has already uh, suggested that he believes this too, we believe that the UK's university sector should be central um, in, in helping to deliver um, the global Britain agenda and in many respects already is um, through the work it does to promote both student and staff mobility, but, but also in, in terms of international research collaboration. Thinking about um, uh, student and staff mobility in particular and how we develop that working um, level of uh, knowledge of, of China. Um, Generation UK um, was a, a scheme that was launched by the British Council in, in 2013, but has unfortunately been suspended um, through the pandemic, but aimed to do just that in terms of supporting study and work experience opportunities in China. I'm very hopeful that um, uh, that can in time um, be, be relaunched. However, last year, the government um, also launched um, uh, the new Turing scheme um, to provide international opportunities um, in education and training across the, the world to, to UK based students. Um, and this scheme is therefore likely to become another channel for students to visit China, um, supported by dedicated um, pots of, of funding, which is, is really welcome. And indeed, um, the DfE has already reported significant interest in China as a study destination amongst students. I think it was second um, most popular in terms of applications that were made to the first year of, of the Turing scheme. Clearly, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has and, and will continue to have um, a significant uh, negative impact on the progress in, in outbound bound mobility um, and, and to do so for, for the foreseeable future. However, we have been seeing a greater emphasis being um, placed on virtual and blended mobility. And I think there is a real opportunity here to widen the scope of access um, to learning and understanding from others, especially when we're thinking about the context of developing that working level knowledge of, of China and, and the society there. And indeed, the, the trend um, there in terms of virtual Mobility and blended mobility was a trend that was already um, emerging before the COVID-19 outbreak um, related to um, imperatives around the, the climate crisis, but one that has, has of course been accelerated um, by it. Um, so I'm very aware of time and I'll, I'll probably conclude there, but just to conclude very briefly, I wholeheartedly agree that um, with the, the sentiment that expert and, and working knowledge of, of China is crucial, um, regardless of the UK government's policy position. Um, and that the higher education sector and, and the universities in the UK can play a really key part in, in driving this agenda forward. Uh, thanks, Steph. That's fan fantastic. Um, uh, I'm going to move with no further ado over to Professor Gregory Lee, who's Professor of Chinese Studies at the University of St Andrews. And as Michael said at the start, we're very grateful for the support that St Andrews have given us uh, on this project um, throughout. Uh, and so, um, uh, thank you for that. Um, and Professor Lee specialises in the culture and cultural history of China and its diaspora from the 19th century to the present day. Um, he's particularly interested in the contribution that pre-modern uh, Chinese thought may make to the resolution of contemporary uh, problems. So uh, over to you, Professor Lee. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Nick. I hope everybody can understand me. I feel like I'm bringing up the rear after so many uh, distinguished uh, interventions this morning. Um, it's an extremely useful and timely report that, that Michael's produced. And I'd like to thank him for all his hard work and his patience in, in dealing with uh, the people he interviewed, especially with, with me. Um, it's a balanced report that attempts to account for the diverse picture of Chinese teaching in the United Kingdom. And it is, of course, high time for the UK to revisit its Chinese studies policy. I also entirely agree that knowledge of the Chinese speaking world should not be limited to learning the language. And I'd certainly be in favor of a, a qualification uh, that stressed uh, Chinese history and culture in schools without, without an obligatory language element. I think the recent world events have shown that an understanding, not just of other countries as objects, but of how others see their place in the world is crucial to the smooth running of global affairs and the maintenance of peace. This report 
therefore rightly focuses on the provision of the teaching of Chinese studies in our educational institutions and the need for it. It focuses in particular on, on modern standard Chinese or Putuhua, what is called in the title uh, Mandarin, in other words, the national language of the PRC, which, which is in fact simply a written down uh, version of uh, Mandarin when it's uh, in its written form. But as Rana has said, uh, and I was very happy to hear him say that, the family of Chinese languages is rather uh, more vast than that. And the dominant Chinese language of the Chinese community in the UK is, uh, of course, Cantonese, a dominance that has over the past year or so been reinforced by over 100,000 Hong Kong BNO visa holders who are now in the United Kingdom. 100,000 more applications are in the pipeline. It's estimated that up to 400,000 more will apply over the next five years. So these migrants are highly educated, they're multilingual, and will make a great contribution to British society. So I think there's also a need to think about language provision for, for these families and for the future generation of uh, school children in this growing Hong Kong Chinese diaspora. I think it's also totally legitimate that they should wish to learn or maintain Cantonese as one of their main languages. And I think that that choice should be facilitated by examining boards and teaching institutions, at least, at the very least, in allowing the possibility of using full form, or what is sometimes called traditional Chinese characters. Uh, and that should be respected both by teaching institutions and examining boards. And last year in, in 2021, uh, another government, the Irish government, concluded a memorandum of understanding with China, which basically handed over to the Chinese government the provision of high school teaching of Chinese. And it seems that uh, anything but the use of simplified characters will be excluded. And there's, a, there's a, another reason why this is important that I'd like to uh, come to, and uh, I, I shall do right, right at the end of, of my remarks. I'm stressing the interest of taking a wider vision of Chinese studies, which is what we try to do at, at St. Andrews. Um, and we have a vision of the study of the Chinese speaking world rather than just of uh, China. But we cannot deny the centrality of China proper and the importance of keeping a conversation going with China's authorities and with its citizens. And that's been pointed out by several uh, of the speakers this morning. So in, in conclusion, I'd say this report is a fine basis for further reflection on how we should proceed with the long overdue reinforcement of Chinese studies in our schools and universities. But I just wanted to say one or two words about what both uh, Joe Johnson and, and Rana Mitter said. Um, I think Joe Johnson, in talking about the reciprocity and knowledge transfer, has really put his finger on a, on a central issue and also the danger of China decoupling. Uh, Runner also stressed the, the need for people to get back to China. And of course, it's not just about language learning, it's about understanding the society. And I absolutely agree with that. But if we are to build in a sort of risk uh, management of how we deal with the need of our students to learn Chinese in the Chinese speaking environment, then I think we need to address the elephant in the room, uh, which is Taiwan. And uh, perhaps I'm the only one here who can remember when China was closed and when uh, United Kingdom and other Western students went to Taiwan to learn Chinese. So that is an option. It's one of the options we keep open at St. Andrews. Uh, mobility uh, options are important and uh, that links to the question of why I think it's important also for people to be exposed to full form or traditional characters. And I'll conclude my remarks right there. Thank you so much, Gregory. Um, I'm, let's go straight to the Q&A because we've got uh, five panelists, uh, uh, the, four, the four speakers and then Michael, the author. Um, and I'm going to take them pretty much in the order that the questions are listed in the Q&A because that shows us which are the most popular ones. They've been upvoted. Um, so let me, and we'll take them in clumps and please don't, Phil, you need to answer every point because it'd be great to get through as many questions as possible. The first question is from an, an anonymous person. 
um, about uh, the fact that there's no appropriate single Chinese A-level exam suitable for non-native students in the UK. How do we address this? Um, it's mentioned in the report. I was very struck. I, looked, I was looking at a school prospectus the other day that offered Chinese A-level, but only Mandarin A-level, but only they only allowed their Chinese international students to do it. Uh, it simply wasn't open to their British students. Um, which uh, struck me as very uh, 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 pertinent to this conversation. But let's go to Francis, Francis Waveman, who's also got a question about year 12, year 13 uh, uh, qualifications. Francis, your microphone should be on now, I think. Can you hear me now? We can, perfectly. Okay, so it was um, simply following on from that, and basically I was um, wanting to absolutely endorse the suggestion in the report about um, the ideal of continuing the pre-U. Um, it's a really, really good qualification from a university perspective. It's been, um, you know, it's, it's been really helpful seeing students coming through, not just with the language skills, but also with the culture skills. Um, but I think, you know, I, I worry that we're just too late for that. Um, and that the, I mean, we've all made representations to try to get it to be continued. Um, and, you know, it seems like, you know, the, the moment may have already passed. And if that is, I think we just need to look at other options. I noticed Rob Neal in the, in the chat has also suggested an option of allowing English students to take Scottish qualifications and so on. Um, it is, as the report says, quite an urgent um, need to address this um, for students coming through. So I just wondered if the panel okay. had any ideas on that. Thank, Thank you. you, Francis. Which is your own institution, Francis? Um, I'm from the University of Leeds. University of Leeds, great. And I'm gonna take a couple more. And as I say to the panelists, please don't feel you need to answer every point, but that's a powerful uh, point about pre-U and uh, uh, year 12, year 13 qualifications. Uh, David Law has a question about CIs, by which I think he means Confucius Institutes, David, is that right? Indeed I do, Nick. I hope colleagues can hear me. We can. Um, I'm David Law from Kiel University. Um, contemporary China, obviously a very political subject, but understanding China, its languages, history and culture is much bigger than politics. Um, we've been working on a proposal for a Confucius Institute at Kiel for about a year, and we've come up against some very strong opposition, uh, who, to paraphrase, say that this would be inviting a nest of spies onto the university campus, the eyes and ears of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I, I know this is a highly political issue. I know there are risks. Uh, but I would like to ask our informed panelists about whether there's really any strong evidence, because I haven't found any, that uh, Confucius Institutes in the UK have been misused. I know there have been cases in Europe. I know that in America it's highly political because of the denial of research funds to American universities who kept CIs open. But it's clear from the report that the CIs do play a role in the uh, early development of Mandarin, of, of understanding more about China, and thus it's part of the bigger picture that you're all talking about. Thanks, David. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's a very important point, and there is a section about Confucius Institute in the report, and we'll have Michael respond to that in a moment. Mary, I don't know. I know you have to leave early. I don't know if Mary Kerner Cook is still available online. I know she has a board meeting she has to go off to, but uh, Mary, if you are, I think you are fantastic. Can we get your question? Maybe someone needs to unmute. I'm not sure if it's Mary herself or Emma, but uh, we can't currently hear you, Mary. Mary's question, perhaps, uh, 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 Mary's question is, doesn't driving demand to learn Mandarin rely on students being interested enough in China and Chinese culture and politics to want to learn it? In other words, you need more China-related curriculum in history, literature, politics, sociology, economics, and so on and so forth. Uh, if the school curriculum is almost entirely UK or European, you're unlikely to make progress in uh, stimulating demand further up the education scale. So let's go. I think Michael is the author. Um, don't feel, don't answer every point, but which of those points do you want to pick up? Sure, I'll pick up the first and the last, and I'll leave the Confucius Institute um, to the other panelists. I think um, <clears throat> really quickly on the appropriate qualification for year 12 and 13, um, you know, Scottish qualifications, um, 
a mix of an HSK and a, an extended project are sort of viable short term. But I think really longer term, the solution has to be how languages are approached <clears throat> more generally and, and noting the divide and the difference between the challenge for a student learning French as opposed to a subject like Mandarin or Arabic. Um, and that there has to be something more structural changing. But for the short term, it, it seems like these might be useful um, uh, short term solutions. On the, on the point around, um, on Mary's question on needing to stimulate demand, yes, I completely agree. Um, I think um, I think maybe one of the challenges is that um, you know the, the cultural appeal of China isn't, isn't isn't doesn't share the status of sort of Korea and Japan, which have similarly difficult languages. So maybe a useful comparison. And if there was more on the curriculum <clears throat> and more in um, museums and on the, on the on the airwaves, which which engage with China in an interesting way. Um, then I think you know more people would be interested, and you see you see the numbers of undergraduates taking modules in on topics related to China in university. So there's clearly interest, but it's just about when they're exposed. So I would agree with Mary; you absolutely have to um, uh, do more on the curricula, and I think that's why an A level civilization would be would be really useful as well. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, Joe, let's go to you next. I mean, yeah, just to build on Mary's, the other element of Mary's point, which was that you know, we, can't we can't rely on um, you know, the exam boards and, and the providers of qualifications to drive uh, uptake of, of Chinese language study, because you know, we're, it's absolutely critical that there is this broader awareness of the need to understand and engage with a, a country that's going to account for 25% of global GDP and be incredibly important for uh, companies in the UK that, that are globally engaged. So I think making, making young people, learners, um, aware that future employment opportunities um, you know, will depend to some extent on an ability to be part of this uh, engagement with China that is going to be an inevitable feature of all of our lives over coming decades um, is, is a really important part of it. And that, I think, is, is the precondition of seeing an uptick in, in actual numbers studying, studying Chinese, which is, a, I think, a very useful point Mary's made. Um, on the Confucius Institutes, but I, I agree with the question, uh, uh, the, the sentiment underlying the question, which is we need, we need evidence um, to build our understanding of exactly what is going on in Confucius Institutes. Now, clearly there is a legitimate role for encouraging the study of Chinese languages and study of Chinese culture, but there is also a line which has to be protected and that our higher institution, higher education institutions need to need to be vigilant over um, when, when institutions stray into sort of being propaganda vigilantes for the CCP on campus and stamping out freedom of speech, if there is any evidence of that. I mean, I think globally there has been a trend for these institutes to um, to withdraw from university campuses and to close down rather than to open up in vast numbers. Um, so my understanding is in the States, they've been, uh, they've been shutting in quite considerable numbers. In the UK, I think we've got about, Michael's report, I think may, may give greater detail, but my recollection was there were around 30 in the UK, but I think numbers have, have stalled. And I don't think there is a big wave of Confucius Institutes opening up um, and on the contrary, um, I think there is, as, 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 as the report may, may mention, um, quite considerable pushback um, on campuses when they, when they are opening up and when they are deemed to be sort of cross, crossing that line I mentioned. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, Gregory, how does it all look from St Andrew's perspective? Um, well, we don't have a Confucius Institute at St. Andrews, and it's not in our plans at the moment. But, um, you know, Nest of Spies is, I mean, I think we leave that to, to MI5. I'm sure they've got, they've got a big file on, on what's going on in Confucius Institutes. So I'm not too worried on that count. Um, there, there are all kinds of Confucius Institute experiences around the world, in Britain and uh, elsewhere. I think the main thing to be worried about is the control of the teaching agenda. So, uh, you know, if you can't get guarantees about what you can talk about, you know, can you talk about Xinjiang? Can you talk about Hong Kong? Can you mention Taiwan? Can you talk about human rights? Then, then that starts to be a problem. Uh, and then, of course, language teaching isn't some free-floating neutral exercise. You know, language is a, a social and political uh, thing. And so, 
if you can't broach these questions in language classes, uh, then there's a real restriction on, on, on academic freedom. So that would be my concern. Um, and I know that a lot of universities see it as a quick fix and a cheap quick fix to uh, bringing in Chinese language teaching. But um, if you're going to do it, uh, then you have to be extremely vigilant. Thank you. Um, thank you for that clear answer. Uh, Rana, and then we'll go to that. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's been very, said very well by others already. I, I don't have direct uh, experience with Confucius Institutes, uh, but we don't have one at Oxford. But um, I will say, and we actually have a very long standing programme that we ourselves have designed uh, with our agenda in mind, not the agenda of anyone else, which is in partnership usually with Peking University, but it's very much an Oxford programme that's designed for that purpose. I think Gregory said it very well. The main issue and I think this is true not just of China topics, but it's certainly true of China topics, is that any academic development in a British university, whether it's a Confucius Institute or whether it's a scientific collaboration, which to be honest, actually in monetary terms is usually far more lucrative in terms of the kind of large scale collaborations and engagements that most universities in the UK are interested in, in doing. Confucius Institutes and language teaching are very, very small beer in, in, in comparison that none of these things in any way constrains what has to be the primary duty of the university, which is the free, frank and robust expression of views. And when we are talking about modern China, of course, we are talking about economic development, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about poverty reduction, and all the things that the Chinese state would like us to talk about and that we should talk about. We also need to talk about Xinjiang, Taiwan, human rights, all of these issues too. And, you know, without wishing to make a fuss of it, <laughs> there's at least one person I know on this call who has personally been, you know, very badly treated by the Chinese government with sanctions precisely for talking about these areas. So there is clear evidence, first of all, that this is not widespread in the UK sector. I think that is important to point out, but also that it is not absent. And therefore, what we have to be doing now is a wider version, I think, of the message that's been going through all of this conversation this morning. As the UK higher education sector, working with government, working with business and working with the public sphere, work out now what we think about our values, about our, you know, the economic elements and about the security elements, make our positions clear and then engage with them in a robust, friendly, but absolutely clear way on our agenda, not on someone else's agenda. That is, I think, the, the driving red line that has to run through it. And it will lead, I think, as it does in other cases, to an extremely fruitful engagement with China, which is a place that has plenty of its own red lines, knows about them, and is not shy about putting them forward when it sees its interests are being, uh, being um, in some ways, encroached. Thanks, Rana. Steph? Yeah, I'm just on, on the second question and I completely agree with, with Rana's um, points there. And to be honest, Nick, I, I think at Universities UK are... Um, our approach really has been about how we can help uh, our institutions kind of manage risks that, that come along with, with internationalization and, and partnerships. I think everybody, I hope everybody, all of my panelists on this call are agreed that um, universities are and should be outward looking uh, global places that have strong international partnerships. Um, but we need to make sure that we're doing that with our kind of open eyes um, and that we're robustly protecting academic freedom and institutional autonomy and our, our own values. Um, and I think, you know, I and, and Universities UK absolutely believe that a responsible attitude to um, managing that risk is essential um, in standing up um, for, for the kind of principle of, of also in engaging in teaching and respect, uh, research irrespective of, of, of geography and, and politics is, again, I think we've discussed as being really crucial to today. Um, you know, we have and continue to work um, with, with government on a range of kind of um, initiatives to make sure that decision makers in universities have the information, advice and guidance that they need to make informed choices. And, and again, I think Michael's report today kind of highlights what more we could be doing to make sure that that knowledge is within our institutions and is also um, within wider society. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, just to, to agree, really, but just to kind of um, flesh out that I think universities do take that agenda really seriously. We take that agenda really seriously and, and thinking about what more we can do together to make informed choices is, is really important. Thank you, Steph. Um, I'm now gonna do one sort of, one uh, bumper round of questions, which will be the final round because we are due to finish at 10.15, which is in 11 minutes time. One bumper round of questions and then go back to all our panelists to respond to any comments they wish them to make any final remarks. So um, can I go to Amanda Kindness? Amanda, tell us which institution you're from as well.
Hi, Amanda. You're on, I think. Oh, we, 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 oh, let me read Amanda's question because I don't think the tech is working there. <clears throat> Amanda's question is about an increase. Uh, do you think an increase in joint degrees and major minor degrees would also help this issue? Or does it need to be Chinese study degrees in full? Conscious that Scotland has a broader model where students can take little bits of study uh, in other subjects alongside their main subjects. And Liz Morish, uh, who's a former happy author, has, has also asked a similar question about subsidiary subjects at um, undergraduate study. Um, uh, so something around, does it need to be a full Chinese studies degree or could it be uh, part of? Jane Zeng, can we go to Jane? Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, yes. Um, my question, it is that, uh, it's actually, sorry to go back to actually what we've been talking about. I am from a, a secondary school in London. Uh, and uh, we have been actually uh, promoting Chinese for 15 years and 16 years now. And uh, uh, we're talking about the uh, collapse of the pre-U uh, you know, qualification. And now what lead to it is that we cannot actually, uh, talking about uh, earlier on panel, this is talking about the uh, not enough demand for university places. And what is now, uh, we have very high number of students want to, uh, studied uh, Chinese uh, in university, but what is the problem? Because now we all have to take the uh, at Excel uh, uh, A-level, and what we're facing is that the great our student, we actually has the best linguist, I'm not uh, joking, uh, in, in my uh, school. And uh, But the problem is that if they're taking A-level, they only get to, uh, I use all my nights and days, I could only get them to B, and university would not take them. And that is the problem. That's the bottleneck. And this is the, how the panel, you think, how could we actually read this problem? Uh, need to really need to solve urgently. So, uh, Thank yeah. Thank you Sorry. about the pipeline and the inappropriateness of the A-level. Thank you. Carol, can we go to Carol Rennie? Hi, Carol. Hi there. I'm somebody who studied Chinese, you know, to a fairly high level, but has now moved out of that area. And I think it really is important, as Rana mentioned, that when we're thinking about better understanding of China and the UK and more collaboration, that that language is, is really just one small part of the big picture. And the key thing is that we should be capitalising on really building relationships with the thousands and thousands of Chinese students that are here. And I'm not quite sure how that can be done, but uh, Rana's right. It's what you really want is a sort of popular interest in China, more and better BBC TV programmes on China, more radio programmes. And that's the key so that people are open to and want to get to know Chinese people and understand a bit more about China today, because otherwise there's, there's just no hope. People haven't got the time to, to put all the hours in that are necessary to learn Chinese and then go on to do other things which will give them proper careers and um, okay. you know, work in other areas. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. I'm going to squeeze in two more and then it'll have to be very brief responses. But um, I want to squeeze in John Clawton because he was mentioned in Joe's opening remarks, former uh, head teacher and now campaigner on languages, and also Will Hazel, uh, a, a journalist uh, uh, from the I. So, uh, John. Thank you, Walter, and, and thank you, Joe, for the uh, name check. I, it's the least you owe me. Um, the uh, my question is really is there's obviously an awful lot of effort being put into uh, teaching Chinese through the Mandarin Excellence Program and the SWA Foundation in primary schools and in secondary schools. But going back to the point about how complex uh, it was described as a famously difficult language, um, uh, but it's much harder than Greek. Um, uh, really, are, are all of those efforts actually doing anything towards generating the pipeline that you're talking about to get into university? Or does one have to accept, like modern, like classical languages are accepting, that they're largely going to start teaching it um, in university rather than in school? Thank you, John. And of course, you can do classics courses, can't you, with no classics? Uh, well, incre classical. well, incre increasingly, even at Oxford and Cambridge, the majority of people who are arriving there with either only one classical language or no classical languages, it's a complete transformation. 
And even French in, in Oxford is looking at ab initio French to show how the language market more widely is changing. Um, and trying to make Chinese work in a world where all modern languages are under pressure is incredibly difficult. Thank you, John. So let's go to Will Hazel's question because it's linked to that. And then I'm going to go back to the panel because otherwise we're going to run out of time. Will, Will, you've got a question that's linked to that. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, follows on from John's question. I was very struck by Joe's comments about the overall decline of language learning in the UK. I was just wondering if I get his thoughts and those of other panellists about how we should revive language learning in schools and universities. You know, does it start with bringing back a compulsory uh, language at GCSE, for example? Thank you, Will. Right, we have five minutes and five panellists. I'm afraid it is just a minute each. Max, um, Steph, we'll go to you first this time. Thanks, Nick. I'll um, probably just pick up on Carol's point and, and about how we kind of um, ensure that we are connecting with the, the kind of time Chinese students that, that we have in, in the UK. Um, and I know, Carol, your point was much wider than this, but I guess on the, the narrow point about um, how we ensure that we're learning from those students and allowing kind of British business to, to kind of um, learn from those students as well. That, that is an issue that, that I think at UK we thought about a few times and, and thinking about how we can perhaps set up some kind of um, graduate employability scheme that, that helps not just um, international students, but students who have um, language capabilities to then um, work with uh, British businesses to, to kind of um, uh, help them to export or explore um, new markets. And there is such a scheme that, that exists in Northern Ireland that we look at um, with, with kind of um, great envy and, and, and I, I guess um, wish that, that we could set up across the, the whole of, of, of the UK. So that is something that we have um, bothered lots of people about. I'm sure I've bothered Joe about it um, once before as well, but something that we're keen to, to, to see taken forward and um, think about how we can make sure that our international um, students and those with language capabilities are um, yeah, working, have the opportunities to work in the UK, but, but also support the UK economy to grow. Thank you, Steph. And, and thank you too for all the you've uh, done in your time at uh, the International Unit for push uh, sage and wise uh, agenda on all of this. Um, uh, Rana. Yeah, just a very brief comment, um, uh, really, I think. Um, I think the one thing I'd like to take away and, and put into the, the, the conversation at the end is that I think the discussion has been very helpful because I think it reminds us that if we spend all of our time, as opposed to a significant amount of time, sacrificing our time on the altar of language learning, then we may get distracted from a wider benefit, which is this idea of China literacy without necessarily having a language. I, for one, am very much in favor of trying to push as much Mandarin language and Chinese language more broadly, Cantonese and other languages where we can. But I think, you know, realistically, for reasons people have pointed out, it is going to be something that does take time. And it's just going to be something that from an Anglophone point of view is tough to, to do. So those numbers will be small relatively speaking, for some time to come. But the wider project of trying to give people an idea of what China is, what it's about, so that they can make up their own minds from a position of knowledge. I sometimes like to say that the UK has gone from a position of deep complacency on China to a position of sort of slight hysteria without any intervening period of deepening of knowledge. And I think that while whatever viewpoint people want to have about China is going to be something that will have to form them as you know, people in, in the public and private sphere. It must come from some level of understanding of what the place is, what it's like, and what it's actually about. And I hope that you know, there are agendas we can take on that engage with language, but are not just about language learning. Thank you, Rana. And uh, notwithstanding your point there, it's not all about language learning. I'm gonna to go to Joe next. And Joe, I think Will Hazel's question in particular was aimed at you. What should the government be doing? To encourage language learning? Um, well, I mean, other than as I as I said in my opening remarks, you know, having a having a, a broader sense about you know what language learning can look like in schools, and uh, you know, the the Wallow campaign that John's Clawton's leading is is a helpful indicator of that. Um, you know, clearly there are trade offs in, in the way recent reforms over the past decade have sort of operated on schools uh, in terms of driving focus and. Uh, with, with, with the EBAC and the Progress 8, with um, breadth being sacrificed uh, in, in key in, in certain ways to, at the expense of um, creative subjects, design and technology, and also languages. There is that trade off. Um, and, you know, I think it's uh, appropriate, you know, all getting on for a decade after we initiated these reforms as a government. Um, that we that we looked at the costs and benefits of that trade-off and took a took a took a 
a collective view about whether we're happy with them. Thank you, Joe. And, and of course, our previous work on language learning across all languages shows how difficult it is to bring back a compulsory GCSE because you need the teachers and we don't uh, have a ready supply of teachers in lots of uh, languages. Um, Gregory. Yeah, just uh, two things that people have mentioned, uh, joint subject degrees, and, and of course, that's what we do here at St Andrews. So uh, double degrees and then the sub honours, even three subjects are taken by the students. And this year we've even got a student who's doing Chinese and physics. So, you know, that uh, that's that's the kind of uh, option I think people should have. And then they can decide over the, those two years whether they want to carry on and be specialists or whether they've they've seen enough and learned enough. I think that's a very good uh, way to open the door to Chinese studies. We've got two streams, ab initio and uh, prior learners. And the surprising thing is we're getting increasing numbers of prior learners wanting to, to, to come to St. Andrews. So last year, it was about 25%. This year, it's looking more like 50%. And all of that actually is thanks to programs like the Pre-U. But we admit people in IB, Scottish Advanced Higher, and uh, A-level and US qualifications. So that, you know, there is a demand at that level. And I think we'd be, be wrong to think that it's just about ab initio. In fact, the, the schools are doing a great job in producing people who can come in with, with already acquired Chinese language skills. So I, I don't think it's, it's, it, it's a flat picture at all. I think there are, there are some very interesting features that we need to uh, take into account and we need to keep all the options open for school students. Thank you, uh, Gregory. And thanks again for St Andrew's support for this report. We can only do reports like this with the support we get from institutions. So thank you again for that. Michael, final word to you. Uh, we don't have long, but there are lots of questions and there's lots in your report about year 12, year 13 uh, and the pipeline. I don't know if you particularly want to address that challenge. Yeah, for sure. I think um, that's probably, that's, as, as somebody said, it's probably the biggest block in the, um, in the pipeline at the moment um, is, is with pretty shutting down the lack of um, a way for students who are enthusiastic and do want to study it at level three to be able to do it and still go on and, and reach um, university. Um, so if there's, you know, I think one thing to focus on, which if we could fix today, then it, it would be that. Oh, well, thank you, Michael. Um, and, and, and thank you to all our panellists. I found it a really stimulating session. I've learned so much from all uh, five of you. Um, and thank you to Michael for, for doing the hard work, including after he had left HEPI as a paid employee and continuing to see this project through. So uh, we're really uh, pleased and proud to have been able to publish it. Um, thank you too to all of you for listening in. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Emma, Lucy, Laura, uh, Alexis, for all the, uh, 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 the organization that goes into an event like this. Um, we have recorded the event. We'll make it available on our website. Do read the whole report. Do look at uh, uh, all the uh, output that our panelists have also written on this topic. And um, thank you, uh, thank you again. And, and if anyone would like to write for us on this or other topics, it's an agenda that we would like to continue uh, following and, and, and pushing the boundaries on. Um, many thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>